Good morning everyone and welcome to this week's Life on the Hulls and I'm up in Yapoon and uh, just out there is Great Keppel Island and North Keppel Island and it's very hard for Janet and I seeing all these areas from the shoreline and thinking that'll be us in a couple of years. Can't wait to get up here. we have just taken off on my bike now. I've actually booked Janet into a small resort down the road here. She's got sciatica and uh, it's pretty bloody miserable and it's really tough to see Janet who's always so active laid up. So I'm out getting some exercise and giving her a bit of a break from me uh, right now. So I had a, about a 10k bike ride down to this beach here. I'm not really sure what it's called, but it is stunning and I've been riding along the beach having a really nice time and I am the only one here. This is the beauty of Queensland. You can find remoteness without any effort at all. So this week we're going to be uh, continuing on with our sugar scoop extensions or our hull extensions, I like to call them. And, uh, and there's going to be a lot more to come with this part of the project. Today, I'm gonna to spray up my hull extension on this side, and I'm already, I've basically wiped off the release wax, so I'm about five minutes from starting. I've got my gun up here. I'm just gonna use a HVLP gun to lay this up, and then what I'll do is once I get it down, I'll then just give a light brush over the top, because you can't get the volume out that I'll get with my big gel coating machine that I have here. The problem with the gel coating machine is to do a small part like this, and fellas, I consider that to be a small part. Uh, that's around about three liters of gel coat is gonna go into that. And uh, that is a small part in, in comparison to the beast beyond. But um, the HVLP gun's fine. It doesn't deliver a hell of a lot of material as you'd think, like a popcorn gun or a G100 sort of gun. But it gives you enough to get your base layer down and then the worst case is you just spray over the top or you come back and back gel it with another layer with the gun or with a brush. You know, I can always brush it after that because the thing is the first layer is the important one. And to be honest, if you have a look at my extension over here, if you have a look at this extension over here, all of that's going to get sanded off anyway. So there's quite a lot of... Uh, of uh, effort gonna go into getting that sanded off. But the beauty of it is, is that I'm getting something down that's going to release off this mold. I'm gonna go and uh, have a cup of coffee and then I'm gonna get into that and get that done because uh, it's a most beautiful day. Now, interestingly enough, two weeks ago when I did that one, Janet was here to help me. Today, she's not. And, uh, and Jervis Bay Marine uh, Rescue is always looking for volunteers and Janet's decided that uh, now that she's sort of temporarily finished work She can fill in a bit of time and get a lot of experience on boats and she's doing marine radio courses Rescue courses navigation courses and all these as well Which is gonna be great because that means I can sit on the back deck have a few beers while she helms and controls the team It looks like I'm not gonna be the skipper by the look of it, but uh, that's the way it is when you're in a marriage and uh and yeah, very proud of her for doing that because it's been a lot of time. She's getting up at 5 a.m. going in and sitting on the radios in the tower there opposite the uh, the opening to Jervis Bay and, you know, logging in all the boats going in and out. And yeah, it's a brilliant thing. It's an absolutely brilliant thing for her to uh, to get her teeth into. But for me, back to the old grind. Right, all set up, ready to go. I've got everything I need over here. Uh, all my gel coat and over here I've got a bit of a cleaning station. Now, I've done a video on the composite shop on how to clean a HVLP gun. A lot of people are using these things and dismantling them every time. Really not necessary, as long as you get all the material out of your gun, which I intend to do. I like to dump it all. And uh, and then you can basically go through a cleaning process where you don't even have to remove or, or clean the gun out. Provided your gel coat was clean and everything else is good, you can do it with a range of uh, techniques that I've got there on the composite shop. I'm going to put a link right up, I think it's up there. And uh, you can click over there later on at the end of this video and then watch that one all the way through. It's only a short one, I think it's like 10 minutes, but what it'll do, it'll give you a good clear indication on how you look after a HVLP gun. Because these guns I've had for years and they have been just bulletproof. Uh, provided you don't let the shit go off inside the gun. But yeah, for now, you can see I'm pretty well prepared. I'm all masked up. I've masked up wherever I need to. I've got tarps up for overspray just so I don't taint any of the uh, area around us. Got my compressor on, got my refrigerator on, got an extra uh, moisture trap in the end of the gun because even the hose will have moisture in it. So you need to remove moisture at every opportunity and let's get into it.
It never goes to plan. I had a bit of a blowout on the gun again. When you're doing a big job like this, anything can go wrong, and the bloody back screw on the pressure um, snaps through. The actual nut with the threaded rim that allows you to control the spray pattern uh, broke, but I was able to manually control the firing pin or the actual needle with my fingers and get even more material out, which was what I was aiming to do. So that's a better result there than I got over there. So it's funny how stuff ups often work in your favor. That one did, luckily. Two and a half liters of gel coat on that particular part. So that's actually a pretty good result. With that extension now gelled up, I'm actually going to work through the maintenance of the gun that I have that I use to apply the uh, resin and gel coat. Now cleanliness is next to godliness in this operation and the maintenance of high quality spray equipment is an essential part of the whole build. Our Graco RS gel gun is made up of many parts that need regular attention at given intervals. And as a young bloke, I was actually a regulated service technician for a large Sydney based dive operation and uh, serviced all of their self-contained breathing apparatus, including positive pressure systems for hazardous materials. So those skills have now come to the fore in this system as the residue can quickly build up and create ongoing problems. The small ball valve at the spray tip of the gun can easily become gummed up with resin. So the first order of the day is to ensure it's operating correctly. And as an actual tip has uh, not much bigger than an opening of a small human hair, um, this viscous resin is then forced through under pressure, so meticulous cleaning is absolutely essential. Unlike a HVLP gun, these airless tips are easily blocked and require meticulous cleaning at every time after use. The final part that requires the attention is the sealing o-ring between the two parts that requires a light coating of silicon grease and a good clean every single time the gun is used. Remembering that acetone strips all of the lubricants from the o-rings it is wise to check other parts of the gun at times to ensure the integrity of these as the catalyst and resin should never meet inside the gun itself the delivery channels need to be separate and the o-rings are the critical part of this system and then finally the machine itself although it's still covered in gel coat on the external surface is meticulously clean i have two main pump units here one which actually pumps the resin and recycles the resin into the drum out of the drum into the drum back through these delivery hoses and the second part more importantly is the catalyst it has a smaller pump system that uh, draws the catalyst from the white reservoir there down into the pump and back into the right reservoir and all i have to do then is switch this ball valve from off to on, which then uh, sends it down to the gun itself. So it's very important that I sit and wait for about five minutes while this is refluxing to allow for the pressure to build up in the system and that then delivers the catalyst down to the gun, all of which is actually air assisted. So the high pressure hose that runs down to the gun system that then allows for the, uh, the aerosol catalyst to then integrate to the resin stream, giving me a very, very good delivery system. Now, while I'm working away on this laminate, I just wanted to discuss a couple of things that came up from last week's video. A few people commented on uh, varying um, occurrences of osmosis in boats over the years. Now, the operator itself or the person laying down the laminate can be the uh, introducer of osmosis into a hole by sweating or any sort of excess perspiration with the laminate whilst you're working over the top of it and I'll tell you now I do sweat quite a lot while I'm working. The other thing too is ambient um, humidity. The humidity surrounding the area you're laminating can also be a big problem with regard to osmosis and uh, using vinyl ester is actually a chemical resistant resin system, a bit like epoxy. In fact, it is in fact a, a modified epoxy, so it's very, very appropriate for the use that we're using it for here. But it is important that I choose a day firstly that has a low humidity. Secondly, that I avoid sweating at all costs into the laminate. And, uh, and thirdly, we don't, we want to make sure that that airstream that is coming out of the gun is as dry as possible. And I use a number of things. I use moisture traps all the way through, plus a refrigerator system that actually removes most of the moisture out as well. So there's a lot of things I do to ensure that that osmosis is not carried through into or between the laminates or in the external or the internal surface of the laminate. 
myself all prepared, sanded it up, got it all ready to go. And uh, Janet arrived, and the second she arrived, she brought the rain with her. So no laminating here for me today, or at least this morning anyway, because the humidity is 100%. And uh, if I was in a factory, I'd probably career ahead regardless, because I'd be on a time pressure. But I'm not going to stuff that laminate just for the sake of a you know half a day's wait. I'd rather go and do something else. And uh, I think I might um, head home and, I don't know, do some gardening or something. Because the place is looking a little bit dishevelled with all the time we've been spending up here. I've just covered it over. It's all sanded, it's all prepped and ready to go. Uh, I've just got to be mindful of the fact that I want to stay within that chemistry. I like to stay within 24 hours to 48 hours max within that vinyl ester chemistry. You don't want to be going any longer than that because I want chemical interface there i don't want a mechanical bond on on the hull it's something i was very mindful of in the in the hull when i laid the hull uh, i always worked within the chemistry wherever i could and made sure that my first six or seven layers were just chemically bonded not mechanically bonded but yeah that's all ready to go it's looking pretty neat now uh, one thing to note here this little rebate here is actually our fuel fillers we've got port and starboard fuel filler hose there and similarly on the other side it has a similar rebate on there so nice thing to know that i actually know where that fits and uh and basically i'm going to be able to put my fuel filler here port and starboard one will go straight to the tank here and the other one will go across to the other side but yep no laminating today this is uh this wet weather has been incessant for four or five months and while i'm outside here this area here is really not easy to keep waterproof, so I'm gonna head off and do something else. on dark and that's taken pretty much all day to get those layers on that 1280 quad with the uh, CSM on it that's an absolute son of a bitch to put on it's um the issue is if you don't have enough resin underneath it and you just got to keep working it and working it but man what, what you're actually getting is five layers in one and it's an amazing product but god almighty right so that now has uh six effective layers but around about 12 layers it's, it's about six millimeters thick so far and i haven't even put the foam on so i've still got foam to put there there and on the hull i'm not going to worry about foam on this section here because that's going to have a lot of reinforcement from the actual stair module it's going to go in and then i'm going to be building it out with some um some mini bulkheads in there i think to to really beef this thing up you know so both sides are now pretty much laminated at the same level uh this one here just needs a couple more layers on the whole part on the, on the actual very bottom there and then i start thinking about bulkheads and starting to integrate the rest of it but yeah that's looking pretty good i'm pretty happy with that uh it is almost dark here oh, i've just had a delivery and uh scott from rw basham's rwb marine uh in sydney has just dropped in one of my six opening side port lights and they're Gibo hatches uh, from Holland and uh, these are ocean rated for the hull sides very important uh, if I was building this to survey in any other country I'd have to have dead lights and uh, it may well be a survey condition here however it's really all I can get without a dead light I could have gone for something like Manship from Korea but they're like five times the price uh, so I've gone with this Gibo oval rectangular type port light and the good thing is that you only had one in stock but i got another five on order and they're going to be about three months so i had one so that means i can get templating and cutting out along the hull sides and that's very important because i have to career ahead and do as much work as i can particularly preparatory work uh, before the goods start arriving on mass especially with the electronics and the instrumentation and things like hatches and I already have a couple of the forward hatches I don't certainly have all the hatches they're all on the one order so they'll all be coming at once so if I can get the holes cut out and do a lot of preparation first that's going to be great now these ones are along the hull sides and the original uh, production boat of this actually had oval port lights so like a diamond shape I guess you'd call it 
Um, I chose to go with these firstly because that's what Gibo had, and uh, and I have access to them. At um, you know, I've been given a pretty good deal on these, and I have to say, but um, they're still ridiculously expensive. But you know, if you're going to buy good stuff, buy good stuff. Don't buy cheap crap when it comes to putting it in the hold of your boat. I'm going to go down and uh, measure these out, get them templated on the wall, drill a couple of holes and get it established where this point is going to be for me to start cutting into my hull side and that's a pretty big moment. So following the letter of the uh, instruction manual it says use the template provided, well guess what there's no template provided with this so looks like I'm going to have to use the, the backing ring and uh, and establish these on the walls here. Now there's a couple of very defined points. This is actually in the master head here. So I'm up in the forward starboard stateroom and this one here is going smack bang in the center of this robe and the forward head and that's going to determine where it goes on the other side. I certainly won't be positioning this one uh, in the center of the spot over there because it's a totally different uh, dynamic in that room and very different outlay or layout in there. The forward head again has to go quite forward uh, just to make sure that I can get it in alignment with the one on the other side in the robe and very very important I do that because I don't want it looking non-symmetrical uh, from the front there's nothing worse but being a cat you can sort of get away with it because it's so wide but I do want them in identically the same position and uh, and then similarly down here above my freezer there's another one here so I've drawn them and uh, what I've done is they're basically just at the point just where the foam starts so it's giving me adequate thickness this here will probably have a liner over the top whether that's just a simple gel coat liner or a cloth liner we're not really sure on the vinyl type liner um, but ultimately i'm going to drill a hole here and here and that will give me the position for the hatch on the outside i will be cutting it from the outside not from the inside to make sure that i don't damage too much gel coat out there and i'll be using probably a stainless grinder wheel for the most part and, uh, and a number of different tools and possibly a router to finish this off. I'm not really sure, but I know it's dead flat on that hole side on the other side. Very important that it fits on a flat surface. You can't put it somewhere where there's a curve. So I couldn't put it here. I'd never want it there anyway, because I've got a gunnel strip, but always on a dead flat surface. And that's around about 30 millimeters thick there, which is within the range of the thickness of the hatch. Don't put it into an area where you've got 50 mil of foam because you're going to have to um, uh, obviously core that out and then reseal it to uh, to make it fit but you know I think I'm pretty much right on this is 20 mil foam and there's a fair, fair bit of laminate to work through so should be good all right scary moment drilling into a boat again Oh, we'll go up and do the head. I can go out and mark it on the outside of the boat. This one's a little bit unusual because it's forward, but it's forward for a reason, so it's in line with the one on the other side. Important to draw at the angle of the wall, and that's actually the angle of the hull side. Um, don't drill flat because you're going to get it wrong. You know, if it's a millimetre out, it's not going to matter, but I like to get it pretty right. seem to be going in and out, in and out, in and out, all day long at the moment. Walking around the front here, get what it's like down here because you don't come around here very often. Oh. Right, so there you can see my two holes and in my uh, blue Peterisms, showing my age here, there's the first one there. So that one's in the forward stateroom and this one's the head. So I'll mark that one and then I'll know exactly where that guy fits. Good thing about being almost 6'3", you never need a ladder, very rare, very rare if you need a ladder. So this is the inner ring and I know it's in exactly the right spot because that's my centre. So one, two, and three. 
So after ferreting around in my bits and pieces, and because I've got a factory where I'm able to store everything I've cut off this boat, I've come to the conclusion I need to make a helm station. And uh, that helm station has to integrate the chart plotter, the wind instrument, the autopilot instrument, the anchor um, windlass switch, uh, the gauges for the engines, as well as the helm itself. So I've sort of been mucking around on Photoshop and drawing and sketching and, uh, and all sorts, and I've come up with this. This here is the, the actual step that I cut out of the stern of the boat. Now I've got a bit of a reasoning here. I don't want to go and create something on the front of the boat that's going to look too space age. It has to sort of suit the lines and the, and the vintage, I guess you'd say, in inverted commas, of the boat. And given that it's around a 20 year old design, I don't want to go putting a 2022 helm station on a 1999 boat, but I do, however, want it to look pretty good. So if I keep with the lines of something that is already on the boat rather than constructing it myself, and I reckon I can do it with this. I've actually done some rudimentary drawings and a bit of photoshopping, and I reckon I can come up with a reasonable looking helm station. It's going to suit the rest of the boat itself. So what I've done is I've actually cut this piece into several components and, uh, and trimmed it up and essentially just bogged it together or, or bolted it together. And, uh, and from there, I can build something that might actually work with this boat. So that will form the beginning of my helm station. I'm not really sure how that's gonna work. It might be a disaster, but you gotta give stuff a go. Um, just by using up parts, I've been able to sort of make a lot of this boat and do a lot of the modifications without doing too much extra effort. But, oh, what's that? And with that little clangor while I fiddle around with the helm station concept here, I'm gonna leave you for this week, but as you can see, I'm juggling many balls in the air at the moment. There is so much going on. The end result here was that I had to leave it for a while. I deduced that the actual thickness of the helm station was way too thick and it will need to be cut back around about 100 mil to be a little bit more slimline, a little bit more accessible. So thanks for joining me and we'll see you next week, guys.